This is Dan McHugh with the NGOs at Unispace 82. I'm speaking to Dr. Peter Glazer, Vice President, Arthur D. Little Incorporated. He's also the president of a new organization called the Sunset Energy Council, an organization that advocates the creation of large solar power satellites, a concept he invented just about the same time the first Unispace conference started in 1968. Could you go into a little bit about the background of your concept? In 1968, I suggested that we place a satellite in geosynchronous orbit in order to convert solar energy in space where it's available for 25 hours a day during most of the year, convert the solar energy into electricity, and then feed the electricity to microwave generators forming part of a large transmitting antenna to send microwaves back to Earth where they can be safely and very efficiently converted directly into electricity. In other words, uh, they, you're above the clouds and you're above the weather. Indeed, we no longer have to be concerned either with day or night variations, and certainly there is no weather in geosynchronous orbit 22,300 miles above the Earth. How large would one of these uh, power stations be? The size of the power station can be adequate to meet the needs of a major consuming center, for example, uh, a major city like Vienna, uh, or as large as New York City. We can design them to meet specific needs of large regions of an industrialized nation, or even regional needs of developing countries. A typical large power plant today is about 1,000 megawatts. Uh, your plant would be the same size or much bigger? Uh, it probably could be about 1,000 megawatts, and if you want to have very large plants, they could be about 10 times that size. Now, in space, how large would that structure be? If you would construct a 5,000 megawatt plant, or about five times the power output of a nuclear power plant, it would be about three by six miles. That's a very in big space. structure. In space, it is the only place where we can build a very flimsy structure of such large area, because there we are no longer concerned with rain or snow or wind, and thus we can cover large areas, which we cannot do here on Earth. How would the sunlight be converted to electricity up in space? In space, we would most likely use solar cells, which are capable of converting electricity, solar energy directly into electricity by the photovoltaic process. And then the solar cells, because they do not use up materials, can last for a long time, as already is the case in many satellites operating now in space. The panels uh, would be much larger, but they'd look something like the panels that were on uh, uh, Skylab, would they not? Indeed, like Skylab or thousands of other satellites, for most of the information we get from space requires power, which is obtained by solar cells by converting solar energy directly into electricity. That means we already are using technology which is very well explored. Now, such a satellite would be located in a particular place in space called the geostationary orbit. Could you explain that? The geostationary orbit is perhaps one of the most valuable pieces of real estate because it has a unique characteristic that a satellite in that orbit orbits the Earth at exactly the same speed of rotation like the Earth. That means that it is stationary with respect to any desired location on Earth, and therefore we can now beam microwaves back to the Earth to any desired location. What would such a large project cost? The cost of this kind of project is very difficult to estimate. Our major effort now is to do research. Already we have carried out research uh, NASA and the U.S. Department of Energy over the past three to five years has established the technical feasibility and indicated that there are no insurmountable uh, problems which would prevent us from continuing with a significant research program for satellites. If you were to build such a station, it would seem to me you'd have a lot of people working in space, a lot of space construction workers. Is that true? Yes, there would be people up there, but not so much in the form of workers, but rather 
controllers of robotic machinery, for example, the Can Canadians with their remote manipulator, already indicated the first steps towards robotics in space, so that the man-machine interface will become increasingly important as we construct large structures in space. Would this uh, structure require a space station and a vehicle that is bigger than the shuttle to support it? Well, the shuttle is an essential first step towards building the railroad into space. Uh, obviously, it, if you uh, say it's a DC-3 of today, we'll eventually have a 747. <laughs> Uh, we don't need perhaps very large uh, uh, rocket ships, but effective ones which reduce the cost of transportation below the cost that it is today. The space station is also an essential step because we will have to learn more about what man can do in space and how long and how effectively he can work in space. This project is so large in scope that it has many aspects that are new and unique, and one of them, I believe, is the financial structures that have been proposed for it. Uh, something perhaps analogous to the Intelsat Corporation? Indeed, Intelsat is sort of an analogy to an international effort, which I believe is essential to uh, achieve cooperation among many of the nations which could benefit from the power produced in space for use on Earth. For example, third world countries require a tremendous amount of energy over the next 20 to 50 years, which could be provided from space. And therefore, nations working together for peaceful purposes in space on solar power satellites would have a goal which every human being could subscribe to. In other words, you'd have one large uh, entity known perhaps in keeping with the name of your organization, the Sunset Corporation, just like you have Intelsat, and you would have perhaps the advanced nations producing the space equipment and the underdeveloped nations producing the ground receivers? That is certainly a possibility, although I believe as time goes on we will see that the third world countries will also become much more adept in the high technology field and already countries, for example, like India, have capabilities along these lines. So I believe we will see more and more nations uh, in being able to take care of projects in space contributing certain components of technology. For example, in Europe already, many countries contribute to European space program through the European Space Agency. And thus, if we have an international program, similar activities by many nations could be taking place. What do you believe will be the payoff of such a project? In other words, how much of the world's energy needs could it meet, and would it meet it at a price that is competitive? The assumption is that it is economically competitive with future energy methods which may be based on nuclear fission, fusion or perhaps even coal. Uh, it is certainly not going to be built unless it is economically competitive. All uh, indications and studies point towards the possibility that it may be environmentally one of the most benign and promising energy conversion methods available here on Earth. The energy crisis in the United States is somewhat in abatement right now. Has that affected the reception of your program in Washington? Uh, I believe really not, because uh, the energy crisis uh, that we are looking towards is not what happens tomorrow at the gas pump, but rather where will we be 10 or 20 years hence. And all of our studies point to an ever-increasing demand globally, particularly by the increasing industrialization of third world countries, for electricity and the uh, decrease in available non-renewable energy resources. What has been the reaction of people here at Unispace 82 to your idea? Well, uh, Unispace 82 certainly is now aware that solar power satellites since 1968 have made major progress. At that time it was considered science fiction. Today it is certainly considered a promising alternative option for the 21st century. What legal or international political issues are you concerned about uh, either aiding or hindering your project? The most important thing is for people to start talking uh, about solar power satellite in the con context that here is the opportunity for peaceful cooperation in space. Dr. Glazer, uh, at this Unispace conference, what do you see as the 
chief issues that could help you or hinder you in your project? One of the chief issues here is the economic development of third world countries. I believe that the, the third world countries are beginning to realize that electricity uh, supply is one of the major things that has to be done in order to allow their economic development. The solar power satellite certainly is one of the few major global options which can achieve that. So in that sense, Unispace 82 is focusing on exactly the same kind of issues that the solar power satellite people are. The constraints here are perhaps the difficulty of bringing together international cooperation among many nations with different viewpoints, particularly North and South, East and West. And yet we have to realize that geosynchronous orbit space is really the kind of environment where all people can work together and I hope over the long term assure the future of humanity. One aspect that's been raised in this conference repeatedly is the role of the military. Does your project have any military aspect to it? This project has no military potential. It is primarily for peaceful uses, commercial uses. Now it is true that if you develop a space transportation system, like you developed a railroad, you can transport on the railroad either goods or soldiers. But this is not a matter of design of the railroad. It's a matter of the politicians and the people who allow things to happen. With your project, it would seem to me, it would work best in a peaceful framework, considering its complexity. Indeed, it would. And by having many nations benefit from it, it can be assured that it will be used for peaceful purposes. And therefore, I see it as a strong force for global peace. Well, this sounds very exciting, but when might we see such a solar power satellite? The research now ongoing would lead me to believe that we could have a prototype ready in about 20 years. We can perhaps do it even sooner if we make a significant effort in that regard. But I believe 20 years is a reasonable expectation to, to develop the solar power satellite so that the nations of the world can have an option which is exercisable by the beginning of the 21st century. Well, thank you, Dr. Glazer. I've been speaking to Dr. Peter Glazer, Vice President of Arthur D. Little Incorporated, the world's inventor and leading expert on the solar power satellite. This is Dan McHugh with the NGOs at Unispace 82. The conference über die Energie vom Weltraum und dessen Benutzung hier auf der Erde in, wurde in Wien veranstaltet um auf Unispace 82 den zugehörigen Behörden die Möglichkeit zu geben, ein größeres Verständnis über diese sehr interessante Sache äh, zu berichten. Ein Sonnenenergiesatellit hat die Möglichkeit, die ganze Welt mit Elektrizität zu äh, befördern und dadurch nicht nur die Industrieländer, aber auch die dritte Welt äh, eine äh, auf stellen, dass im 21. Jahrhundert nicht die Energie wieder das große Problem sein soll, das wir schon bis heute gesehen haben.